Hi, I'm Cinnamon Cooney, your art sherpa, and today I'm really excited to talk to you about color. Color is the most important thing for an artist. It's how we express our visual language. It's a tool we use to communicate feeling and mood and aesthetic and sense of space. But it can also be one of the biggest challenges for artists. So in this video, I'm going to explain to you why sometimes when you mix red and blue, you don't get purple, explain color wheel, what a split primary color wheel is, and what the secret of color math is so that you can get bright, consistent colors that you can count on every time. And you're going to know the secret that your color has been hiding from you. So understanding a color wheel, which is a construct like this, or you might be more familiar with this handy dandy friendly little color wheel that I like to keep around. I like to keep this around because color can be intimidating. And sometimes by making it simple and cute, it helps to remind us that we love color at our very base and our very soul. So even though this is a simple looking color wheel, it's actually a very factually correct color wheel. So what is a color wheel? Well, a color wheel is just a visual representation of color and how color relates to each other. It's a way for us to organize color and its relationships so that we can understand what we predictably can expect from one particular color or another color. But very often what goes wrong for us is we don't understand some basic concepts and we don't actually know how to read the color wheel. Now, the first thing I want to talk to you about is some vocabulary. So there are a lot of terms in color we have to familiarize ourselves with. So we know what we're talking about. And of course, hue. Hue is a big one. Hue is one that artists get hung up on all the time and often don't use really correctly or in a casual way use differently than intended. But we're going to just be like strictly in terms of color theory. What is hue? Well, hue is red, yellow, blue, orange, green, and purple. They are the colors, the primary and secondary colors that you see on the color wheel. They're the color family. Let's think about them as the overarching color family in our color drama, okay? So the original characters for all the spin-off color soaps that we're going to be talking about in this video. So those are our hues. Other concepts that we have to understand about color is terms like chroma or saturation. And what we're really meaning when we talk about that is how pure or vivid a particular hue is. Then we talk about terms like tint, adding white to a color, tone, adding gray to a color, shade, adding black to a color. Neutrals, those are colors like white, black, and gray. All the browns generally are neutrals. The word color itself is a blanket that covers all the tints, tones, shades, and hues completely. So basically whatever color you see with an eye is a color, but hues are about an overarching color family, right? So we've got our dynasty down and we've got our genre that we're talking about, which is color. Now I am going to go back to basics here because I think as a teacher, it's important never to assume that a student knows anything because you never know what somebody's origin story is or what background they have with a particular topic. So the first concept is the primaries. So among our hues, there are three stars. We're going to call them the primaries. And we're not going to just call them that. Everybody calls them that. They're the primaries. And the primaries are red, yellow, and blue. They're always the primaries. And primaries have particular properties. But the first and foremost is, is that you can't use another color to get a primary color. They are primary. All other colors will come from them. Now in the story of our color drama, we have the secondaries. Imagine that there are romance spinoffs that happen with our primary colors. And when a mama primary and a daddy primary fall in love, they get a baby secondary. And basically what I mean by that in that funny way is that if you mix two primaries together, you get secondary colors. And the secondary colors are green, orange, and purple. If a mommy primary color falls in love with a daddy secondary color that's probably too closely related, they get a tertiary color. That's a little awkward, right? But it's going to stick with you. The idea is, is that if you take a primary color 
and you mix it to a secondary color, it's going to make a tertiary color. So if you were to take a primary red and mix it with orange, you would get the tertiary color red-orange. That's all we're saying. But hopefully that funny little moment there will help it stay locked in because those little tertiaries are going to help us understand the secret agenda. And I mean color has one that's going on that's undermining all your bright and vivid colors. The color wheel is divided into two quadrants, the warm colors and the cool colors. So like on mine, if you look here, these are the warm colors right here. And it kind of really goes down almost that red purple, but these are the warm colors right here. And these are the cool colors, okay? So if you think about it in terms like this, fire, sun, warm colors, uh, water, leaves, frozen ice, space, cool colors. Other things to understand about cool colors and warm colors is the way that they play against each other in a visual dance. When you put a warm color next to a cool color, they vibrate and the warm color pulls forward. They don't like physically vibrate your canvas, just visually in your mind. The warm color pulls forward and the cool color recedes back. Now you can imagine when you're landscape painting, if you're needing to push a central figure forward and distant mountains back, understanding that cool colors recede and warm colors come forward is a very important part of atmospheric perspective. So something to know in color mixing, and it's going to apply to everything I'm about to tell you. Whenever, and this is always true, you mix red, blue, and yellow together, you're going to get a dark neutral. Keep that in your mind for a second. Keep that in your like, put that little feather in your cap because it's about to come up a lot. Now this here, this beauty here is a split primary color wheel. And it's different from a traditional color wheel that has three primaries because our color wheel has six. And the reason artists started using a six primary color wheel is because pigment is not light. A lot of the color theory is really about the way light refracts through a lens and translates back to Sir Isaac Newton. Believe it or not, he discovered more than gravity. He also like totally gave us the foundation of color theory. But a little fellow named Munsell came up and said, we need to organize this in some sort of way so artists can talk to each other. And in that world, there was our red, our yellow, and our blue. But pigment being what it is, that wasn't really working for artists. So we now have a six primary wheel. And what you see here is two yellows, two reds, and two blues. What's with that? Well, that's actually because within the wheel, you're going to see that there's warm bias. Well, wait, well, how is bias different than whether a color is warm or not? Well, believe it or not, within each color lies a secret bias that leans it to the cool side of the wheel or the warm side of the wheel. And it sneaks up and it either gives you brilliant colors or terrible, muddy colors. And I like to call all of that awareness, keeping an eye on your thoughts, that hue over there. Because if you don't pay attention to the hidden hue within the color, you're going to get poopy colors. All right. So this is all about preventing the mud, preventing the poop, preventing the things that undermine your color mixing joy. Isn't that kind of like easy to understand when six explained, but super helpful in a practical way? Now let's break this down. In color, we have cool reds and warm reds. Let's look here. I have my two example for my current upcoming project. I have a deep magenta here and a vermilion, okay? So this deep magenta is a cool red and this vermilion is a warm red. Now, there are many colors in pigment out there that are warm reds. Uh, pyro red is a warm red. Cad red medium or cad red light is a warm red. Naphthol red is a warm red. Many, many reds are warm reds. Vermilion very warm red. And what do we mean by warm biased reds? Okay, a warm biased red tends to lean a bit to the yellow. It has a yellow bias in it. That's all we're saying is all those reds are slightly biased, leaning towards the yellow spectrum of your wheel. Now we also have cool reds, quinacridone magenta, deep magenta, alizarin crimson, all, pretty much all the crimsons, Cataract deep, naphthol red deep. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the blues. Now on this particular wheel, I have ultramarine blue and here I have phthalo blue. And this is an area of quite a lot of controversy, okay, on the internet, just a huge amount. And I'm going to tell you what I understand about it. And then I'm going to tell you some strategies to avoid the controversy because nobody needs that in their lives. Basically, 
This is our warm blue because it is bias red. And this is our cool blue because it is bias green. Now, this breaks a lot of people's brains, but it's going to come down to basically this. If you look at the light spectrum and you pull it together, that makes a color wheel. And so many artists will argue that because this is at the end of the color wheel, it by nature has to be the coolest color. But we're not talking about refracted light. We're talking about pigment and the way pigment affects the eye. And what do we know about warm colors? Well, we know that they come forward. And because this blue is red biased, it actually qualifies as warm. And that's pretty much the consensus among paint companies and paint therapists for the most part is that ultramarine blue is warm. Not because of where it lists on the light spectrum, but because of how it appears to the eye when mixed into things and in skies if you tint it. It's something every time you tint it, you will really notice. Now, phthalo blue is referred to as cool because it leans towards this green. You'll even see some phthalo blue labeled green shade. I bet suddenly those of you that have seen phthalo blue red shade suddenly get why there's a difference. <laughs> but basically, this is our green shade phthalo blue, and it's sitting right here. That's the deal with it. When you're out there dealing with other artists and you just don't want to get caught in the controversy, just refer to your ultramarine blue as your red bias blue and your phthalo blue as your green bias blue and just avoid the warmer cool thing altogether. But for your own knowledge, just know that the art world in general calls this warm and this cool. That's what you got to know. Up here to the yellow. Now, I personally have some controversy, some deep controversy on my yellow because of my cool yellow, and I'll explain that in a second. But here is my warm yellow. That's my cad yellow medium, and you can see it's just slightly leaning to the red, so therefore it's warm. And this is my cool yellow, and it's just slightly leaning to the green. Now, any of the warm yellows will be things like uh, cad yellow medium, cad uh, yellow deep. Um, Hansa yellow medium, Hansa yellow deep, see how it's going. Uh, Deluride yellow, uh, Indian yellow, these are all warm yellows. These are yellows that lean to the orange. Uh, yellow ochre is actually warm, it leans to the orange, right? And they have spectrum in relationship to each other, but that's where they essentially lean over the wheel. On this side, on the light, I have a color in my particular paint line that they call Naples yellow. Something you have to understand, just because something's called Naples yellow, there's not a swatch that everybody's going to where they're like, this is Naples yellow. And in the world of paint, there are two Naples yellow. There is a Naples yellow that looks like a Band-Aid that's highly biased orange, high, highly biased to the red. And then there's a Naples yellow that actually is a nickel tight-knit pigment that's highly biased to the green. And it's one of my very favorite colors. I love it very much. Um, it does a lot of really cool, weird, and fun mixes. It's just goofy and great, so I like to use it. But also here would work Hansi Yellow Light, Cad Yellow Light, anything called Lemon. There's a ton of light yellows that you could put over here to get your split primary wheel. Now, once you have your split primary wheel, you can start to see how within each color, there's a secret agenda. Complementary colors exist at opposite ends of the color wheel. They're directly opposing each other and they have a couple properties. All complementary colors contain, if you were to mix them together, three primaries. And what do we remember about three primaries? When you mix them together, you get a dark neutral. So you will hear artists say, I'm gonna tone this color back. I'm gonna knock this color back. And what they're really saying is some part of that mix has got the three primaries in it and it's going to neutralize it out right but generally how they do it is they'll take something like so say you have a warm yellow color and you want to neutralize it you're going to find something in the violet purple range to come here and knock it back and why is it going to knock it back because this has red and this has blue and this has yellow and red yellow and blue are primaries which always make neutral colors and that's why artists have a split primary color wheel because if you take a cool blue and a cool yellow you're going to get a vivid green but if you take a warm yellow and a cool blue you're going to get a muddy green i'm going to really go into this on purple because purple is my favorite color and i think it's one of those colors that people have a real hard time getting because they're given those sets of palettes that have like 24 or 48 or 64 paints in them and they've got a bunch of blues and they've got a bunch of reds they don't know anything about the bias so they do a very reasonable thing and if you've done this 
please let me say from me to you, it was a reasonable thing to do that you mixed a red and you mixed a blue and you didn't get a purple and it freaked you out. This is where that happened, right? So red and blue make purple. Primary red, primary blue make purple, our secondary color, right? Except for biases come into play. And it's about having an alignment, a harmony, that the properties of the colors match well and don't neutralize each other out. So the trick to getting a purple is to match the biases of the color together and avoid getting a primary in there by mistake. So let's talk about that a little bit. So if I want to make a very bright purple, I'm going to pick my magenta and my ultramarine. And the reason I'm going to do that is that there is absolutely no hidden primary factor going on here. This is a cool red. It's biased blue. And this is a warm blue. It's biased red. See how when we talk about the bias, you can see it's red and blue, red and blue, red and blue. Fantastic. And you get the bright purples right here. But what happened here? Well, this is about that bias because we're going to get some primaries that are sneaking into our purple show and messing it up. Basically what happens is this is a warm bias red. What is that? <gasps> it's yellow. And this is a warm bias blue. What's that? It's got green in it, which also has yellow, which means there's a secret primary hiding inside of them, which is why you get this deep, almost neutral purple tint. I'm not saying it won't have any purple appearance to it because it'll bias purple. It's a neutral with a purple bias, but that probably wasn't what you were trying to make when you're trying to make a bright purple. The same goes true for like if you're trying to make a bright orange, right? So this is a cool yellow and this is a warm red. There's a blue bias in here. So when these two mix together, they're going to have a little bit of a neutralizing effect, aren't they? Because there's a hidden primary. You need to make sure that you're mixing to where there is no hidden primary. So a warm biased red and a warm biased yellow are going to give you a bright orange. A cool bias green and a cool bias yellow like Hansa Yellow Light, that's also going to give you your greens, right? But if you took, say, this warm biased yellow and you made it with ultramarine, you're going to get an army green. Now, if you want an army green, that's awesome. But if you weren't looking for it, it's not going to be your favorite. Now, how does this relate to you? Well, I think you should make a color wheel. And at the end of this video, we're going to do a walkthrough of how this color wheel was made so you can see how you can create your own. Again, check the description below because there's a really cool PDF that goes through how this was done. There's wonderful step-by-step -step information at the website. There's more that you can do. Definitely check out the color chart video, which will save you so much money and aggravation. Be good to yourself. Be good to each other, and I want to see you at the easel really soon. Bye-bye!